Welcome to the 36th episode of Let's Conquer Books. Daniel Kahneman, in his book Thinking Fast and Slow, said, A reliable way of making people believe in falsehoods is frequent repetition, because familiarity is not easily distinguished from truth. In this episode, I talk about the book Bad Blood, and how it should be turned into a Hollywood film because of all the characters, storyline, and plot twists. So let's get into it. I'm your host, Alexander the Great Reader, and this is a podcast where we read, study lessons, and build our inner power because the next level we will reach does not tolerate cowards. This episode is inspired by a book I read called Bad Blood by John Carrer Yu. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. And it's about the company Theranos. Initially and throughout its history, it was known as a blood testing company that it was going to make it efficient and very cost-effective way of testing people's blood. They were going to create this machine. To, and through, at its height, it was valued at $9 billion. Then through John Carew's investigation, it was brought to light that they were defrauding investors, clients, and partners. Their technology was never proven to work. There was a lot of covering up and misleading information, which led to Elizabeth Holmes, the founder, and I think she was the CEO, being charged with federal wire fraud charges in just June 2018. And also the president of the company, Sonny Balwani, also charged with the same charges in June. And I recently read that it was planning to sell all its assets for $5 million to pay down the $60 million that they owe in debt to creditors. Now, the first character I want to talk about is Elizabeth Holmes. She is the one who founded the company, the one who's leading the company, the main character, I would say, of this story. Now, she went to Stanford. She was really smart. She studied, I think, biochemistry or something in the field of healthcare. And she started throwing out this idea of getting blood without using a needle. And it was very well received in the community in Silicon Valley, where she started a business in, I think, a garage or basement. And it it started getting momentum and people started loving the idea And soon she actually started hiring people from Google, from Apple. She started getting investors, getting a very attractive and powerful board of directors. Then she eventually started taking on the look of Steve Jobs, where she was wearing black shirt, turtlenecks. She started really portraying herself as the woman Steve Jobs. And then I remember I used to read Forbes and things like that, and she was being proclaimed as the youngest woman billionaire and that her company was going to be worth a lot and was going to change the whole healthcare system. Now, she had a lot of charisma. People immediately liked her, wanted to be part of her vision, her goal. But as soon as you turn, not turn, but said, oh, this technology is not going to do what you want it to do, or these tests are not enough. Anything that was holding the company back, she would turn on you. If you wouldn't just throw throw it under the table or speed up the uh, process or lie, she would turn on you, and she would want you fired right away. And people were like, wow, what happened? She was nice, and now she turned on me. There was a lot of good things about her. They, they said that she was very composed in very high-pressure situations. She was confident. Sometimes she was at meetings, and the 
machine that was going to draw the blood and it wouldn't be working but she would just be like don't worry about it we got this it's just some glitches and she would still get investors and clients and partners at these sales presentations you know everyone loved her investors loved her people she was partnering with like walgreens and safeway loved her her family loved her her family friends loved her now, the second character, this guy's funny to me. He made me laugh throughout this. His name was Sonny Balwani, and he was Elizabeth Holmes' girlfriend, but they really didn't announce that, but everybody knew it. And he met Elizabeth when he was 37 and she was 18 years old. Their relationship was really weird. You know, Sonny became a millionaire because the CEO of the company he was working at quit, and he just took on the position and then like three months later they were bought out and he had a bunch of shares as the ceo and he became a millionaire but then like a couple months later the whole dot-com bubble busted so he just got lucky it wasn't like he was smart or he was doing anything progressive or creative now she looked up to this guy and she even hired him as the president of the company but i saw him more as the muscle for Theranos. he was always the one that did all the firing intimidating of federal people that came to inspect and people who were trying to whistleblow or you know email themselves certain emails that would protect them just in case because they were in charge of certain components of the technology that they could be held liable and they just wanted to clear themselves through these emails that you know pronounced that they were worried and they should be concerned now he wasn't the smartest guy either there's a lot of humor in there of how the engineers and the smart people in the company would say certain words create certain words and say them a lot in a meeting and Sonny will pick up on the word and start using it and they would laugh and then he would even pronounce words wrong (laughs) and they he just kept pronouncing it that way and they would laugh and it was like a joke on him because he was just i guess an idiot you would call it in their eyes you know he came to work dressed like he was going to nightclub they said he was driving lamborghinis and flashy he thought um the power got to his head you can tell He was telling people what to do, intimidating people at the job, making people work, looking at their emails, looking at their punching in and punching out. Very funny character. Now, the lawyers in this story are crucial because they are the ones who actually keep the, I don't want to say scam, but the misleading information going and it was mainly because of this guy called David Bowes. I know they changed a lot of the names. I don't know if in the book, but in, in real life, his name is David Bowes. And he was this high, powerful lawyer that everyone feared. And they couldn't believe that Theranos had this person representing them. So anytime that there was any kind of legal battles, they found out David Bowes was the one representing Theranos. The other lawyer would be like, I I wouldn't fight against this guy. I would just agree to any terms or make a deal. But there was a conflict of interest. See, this is why it's a good story and it's a great story. And he actually was on the board and he didn't get paid by Theranos with cash. He was being paid through company stock. So he had a conflict of interest seeing that this company is successful that way he can cash out and he was known to do that with other companies that's how he became rich the other aspect of the story are the investors i know that she was able to get rupert murdoch to do like a hundred something million dollar investment and when the whole scandal broke out he just sold his stocks at like 10 cents on a dollar and just wrote it off because he's a billionaire larry elson was a big investor and mentor and you know, Larry, Larry Ellison of Oracle viewed her as him when he was younger, going against this big establishments. Safeway 
actually spend a lot of money on remodeling the stores to transition themselves into a place that has a department for healthcare, and they were going to put a lot of the blood machines that Torrenos was developing. Walgreens also did a big deal with them and made announcements, and I think they even had a couple trial runs with the machine. Henry Kissinger, you know, he's a big political figure. He uh, he was part of the board of directors. James Mathis, who you know is known as a great military leader. I remember the story of who he appointed on looking into this company, Theranos, to use them in the military because it could be a fast way to check, you know, the soldiers. And Elizabeth concocted this crazy story that James Mathis actually believed it and confronted the person he appointed, and he almost got into a lot of trouble. Another character is the grandfather of... Tyler Schultz, George Schultz, who was the Secretary of State, and he was also the director of Theranos. So Tyler is the grandson of George, and he ended up, because he worked in a company, he ended up being a whistleblower, and he talked to John Carreyrou, the guy from the Washington Post, and... The Reynos knew that he was talking to him. They just couldn't prove it, but they knew it was him. And he had to shut the communication off with John. And he was being attacked legally a lot. And he was very afraid of what was going to happen. And he remember he talks about a, a story that they were at Thanksgiving at George Schultz in house home and... Elizabeth Holmes was there acting like everything was okay, smiling, and he didn't understand. He was just like, why is she here? She's trying to destroy my life. And then one day there was this meeting that George set up with his grandson, which turned into where lawyers came out of nowhere and wanted him to sign these non-disclosure documents, and he wouldn't do it. And... That led to the John Carew finding out the investigation, doing his thing, you know, like he was actually looking at all those, the people who were referenced to him and he kept building this story, but nobody really wanted to go on record or be mentioned, so it was hard to build this story. And Tyler was key when he he actually said, I'm going to go on record. And they were able to publish the story. The editors were okay. There was a point in time where the editors at the Washington Post said, we're going to do it. And before they did it, they called in the lawyers of Theranos, and they wanted basically to take everything out of there. But they wouldn't do it because they felt that they had all that evidence and the sources to back it up and once that story was released all hell broke loose for that company stocks dropped crazy whereas 90 something percent of their value was taken away it was found out that they were manipulating a lot of the tests that they were doing there was a lot of you know messing around with the tests to make them look like they were doing good There was a lot of messing around with the information they were putting out that was misleading. They're misleading the government officials. The government officials came in right after that story and they proved that these people were not able to do the type of test that they wanted to do. And then it all came crashing down, just like every story. And the truth came out and then John Carreyrou put out the book it's a great book and now it's going to be turned into a movie actually i know that i made this episode thinking that it should be turned into a movie because it's such a great book and it actually is i just when i was googling for the episode i'm like oh wow and legendary studios picked up the book to make the movie you know they're the people who made interstellar an amazing movie hangover 
the Dark Knight Rises 300. And the guy who's going to, I think, write the screenplay is Adam McKee. And he did the big short, which I think is perfect because that book is also a good book book by Michael Lewis. They turned it into a movie. A lot of the characters in that movie are crazy. And the stuff that, like, you cannot make up the things of this Thereno story and the story of the 2008 financial crash. Because it's just so out there. But when you watch it in a movie, you're like, wow, this is real. And the funny thing is Jennifer Lawrence, who she's in the X-Men movies, Hunger Games and American Hustle. She's actually slated to play Elizabeth Holmes, which I think is going to be perfect. She's a great actor. And I can't wait till the movie comes out. The other characters are the whistleblowers. Um... These guys, man, they were trying really hard. They knew that they were failing the quality control checks. They were doctoring the research. They would sil- They were being silenced with non-disclosure emails and documents. They were getting lawsuits, so they were afraid because Thanos at the time had a lot of money, so they were being all shut down. Now... The action step of this episode is read the book because, you know, the saying, the book is always better than a movie. I can't say that now because the movie's not out, but the book was amazing. I read it in two days. I loved it. I recommend it. And it's a good book to see the psychology behind tragedies, tragedies like business strategies like Enron. And there was this capital firm. The book was called When Genius Failed. It was all these smart guys. Well, that was a tragedy because small lies always lead to bigger lies. So you do a small lie and it's not really no harm. But then you do another one and they start getting bigger. And then you start doing whatever it takes to succeed and get that power, get that notoriety, get that market uh, share. You know, they were manipulating the legal system. A lot of tragedies happen because they manipulate the tra- uh, legal system. They were denial, denial that they're doing anything wrong when they know they're doing things. And then the, the power they were gaining in the whole Silicon Valley and in the investor world was corrupting them. And they felt like they had to succeed and they were doing something great. Now... I want to thank all my listeners. We're at 2,500 plays and downloads. Thank you. The reading challenge, I'm at 145 books out of 160. And let's connect on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Spend a lot of time on Instagram. All the links are in the description. Looking for people to interview, show ideas, anything book related. Let's connect and see you on the next one. Please subscribe to this podcast on Anchor, Twitch, google play itunes or any other podcasting platform so you miss next the next episode where i talk about the good that comes from pain